Sex, human sexuality, homosexuality in the 21st century is a really hot topic. You want to hear me tell you what I really think about it? Stay tuned. Hello, I'm Carlton Pearson. Welcome back to Streaming Consciousness or Expanded Consciousness, where we challenge you to think outside the box and to expand or extend the way you perceive things, uh, especially traditional things, models and modalities that you have felt comfortable with in the past, but no longer feel quite as comfortable. And notice that the culture itself is evolving and unfolding in ways that are just astounding. So much is happening. This is a, s a series that I'm doing titled Sex and sexuality, human sexuality, and homosexuality in the 21st century. Pretty provocative, and I must tell you, I've never heard a clergyman speak to this issue the way and as graphically as I am. I've done a lot of research, and it's a popular subject in America and around the world, and particularly in America, but even the Pope recently has softened the Roman Catholic's attitude, uh, the church's attitude toward homosexuality and human sexuality, including the possibility of um, allowing priests to not necessarily have to live celibate lives and women's roles in the church. Uh, this whole sexual war, the conflict between the genders is coming to a, a not a screeching halt, but a, a slow halt. We're starting to get freer with ourselves as a culture. Uh, I opened this uh, series uh, with this quote from Karl Kross, who's an Austrian writer and journalist known as also a satirist and an essayist and a playwright and a poet. Um, but he said, sexuality poorly repressed unsettles some families. Well repressed, it unsettles the whole world. That's a chapter I have in my book titled, If I Wanted Religion in My Bedroom, I'd Give It a Key. It's in this book, God is Not a Christian, nor Jew, Muslim, Hindu. God dwells with us, in us, around us, as us. That divinity expresses itself through us spiritually, Centrally, socially, and sexually. <laughs> what if, this is sort of abstract, but what if God wanted to feel sexual and enjoy itself in human sexuality and created us, created us sexual beings, both for procreation and recreation, or recreation? And all these attitudes, some of y'all think God has, he gets mad and he's jealous and all that stuff. Well, if he, if he, if he, uh, sits on the throne, does he, does he do anything on the throne? <laughs> if you see a physical God, <laughs> does God have sex or want sex? Did Jesus ever get turned on? Uh, he was hanging out mostly with men, except for Mary Magdalene, whom some believe was a prostitute. And unless he was gay, when she knelt over him and rubbed her, his body with fragranted oils and washed his feet with her hair and wept. That's a pretty sensual situation. Not many men could be in it and not get a, li a lead turned on. So it wouldn't surprise me, although there's things like the Da Vinci Code, there's the reference and the allusion to the fact that Jesus may have, uh, to the hypothesis that Jesus may have married Mary Magdalene and that in Michelangelo's uh, picture of, the, of uh, the, Lord, the Last Supper, the woman standing, the person standing to Jesus' left is a woman. If you look at it, I hadn't noticed it. Only recently have anybody, has anybody ever even talked about it. But that he may have had a very intimate relationship with her, spiritually and otherwise. And that, um, of course, most Christians believe in the resurrection. Jesus died, so we wouldn't believe that he married and moved to Turkey or France and, you know, had kids. It's kind of interesting to me, and it wouldn't change, if that were true and they somehow found some kind of documentation, it wouldn't bother me. I'm cool with Jesus being a man. I feel like he was so much man, it's hard to believe he was God. And as Earl Roberts should say, so much God, it's hard to believe he was man. He was man in, he was God in man, with man, for man. 
And that's kind of the way we are. God in us, God with us, God as us expressing itself in the universe. That's an interesting new thought that wouldn't have ever come to my mind just a few short years ago. I am an evolving and unfolding person. Some people like to call me a heretic. I think I'm just enlightened. I really do. I love the Lord and I love what I'm talking about. So I want to start this part of the uh, series with um, another part of my book, that chapter, and I'll, I'll allude to quite a bit of it. If you haven't read it, you're going to want to get it because this is probably one of the most provocative books I've ever written or will ever write because uh, it, it's way out there from, from my first book. Uh, I've written about 15 or 16 books, but these are my two published books by Simon & Schuster, The Gospel of Inclusion, which is basically my scriptural uh, explanation of um, universal salvation. Um, but I use the scripture and I talk about my experience with inclusion and getting kicked out of the church and all that stuff and being made a heretic, called a heretic. And then this book is way beyond that, where we don't talk about gods that require blood sacrifices. It's way beyond that to a whole nother sense of self-actualization and spiritualization and, and a metaphysical approach. I, in fact, I call myself a Metacostal rather than just a Pentecostal. Now, according to the Old Testament scripture, God's first command to humankind was to be fruitful and also to eat fruit. So eating and having sex <laughs> were right at the top of the list. He said, be fruitful and multiply, uh, eat and have sex. The first assignment for human beings was to eat. You're free to eat from any tr tree or truth in the garden and then multiply, replenish the earth. Fulfilling this mission could only take place through the act of sexual intercourse. So, from the very outset of the human race, there has been a divine mandate to be sexually active. Now, there was male and female. There wasn't an, an official wedding or divorce. Uh, but there was male and female for the first purpose of procreation. But in order to do that, there was a certain amount of recreation, first for the male and later for the female, in procreation, or I don't think they would have ever done it. Even two people putting their mouths to each other and, and you know, and slobbering one another. Uh, the things we do when we're really turned on sexually are very sensual and they're abstract and sometimes they just seem stupid <laughs> under normal circumstances. But we do it because we're aroused to do it and creation had to give us that arousal or that erotic desire or appetite or drive to get turned on so we could tune up and reproduce ourselves. Now, Perhaps creation could have made the process of procreation different, but we are what we are. All animals do it. Amoebas do it. Fleas have sex. <laughs> Mosquitoes, butterflies, raccoons, baboons. So uh, very, in fact, there's something having sex on you right now and having a baby. There's something defecating and urinating on you. You can't see, you'll never see it. Some little microscopic life entity, it's all over you. Mites and lice and stuff you, you may never see. Uh, there are things inside you, bacteria. There's living worms inside us, most human beings. And they have sex. And they, they might defecate or, 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 or urinate or regurgitate inside you, on you. I mean, that's the process of life. It seems gross. It sounds gross. But think about it. This is life. So if God decrees sex and tells us to be sexually active, and according to the Jewish Christian Bible, there are only two human beings. Um, of course, by the time Adam had Cain, he was at least 80. So he could have had several other children, but for some reason they don't mention the daughters. And women always get a bad deal in, in Scripture anyway. That's a big, that's a whole nother lecture and I've alluded to in some of my lectures. Uh, but if God does, we, we are created with a divine drive and appetite for both food and sex. And especially in tonight's subject, sex. So why do Christians 
and most other religions have such a problem with a mandate from God to be sexual. And he created us sensual beings. We see, we smell, we taste, we touch, we hear. Not just each other, but houses and cars and nature, a flower, a walk along the seacoast, which I love, one of my favorite places to be on the planet is by the sea. I would live there if I could, try to live near water. Um, I like the mountains too, but I, I really love the sea. I love uh, snorkeling and scuba diving and jet skiing and water skiing. I love, I love the water. Of course, I'm Pisces and I'm drawn to the water. But we're all 80% water, moisture, 80%, 100,000 miles of arteries flowing through us. And in those arteries are vamping and coursing blood or H2O, salt water, really. Um, we're all, we came from the dust, and that may not just mean dirt, but stardust, and as well as the sea. We're some very interesting creatures and very interestingly created. The Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. There's, we're still learning about the wonder uh, of who we are. There will always be something sexual about God and creation or procreation, or there will always be something sexual about human divinity. Something creation and procreation and recreational about us. And our subconscious reality, the act of doing the same through sexual intimacy is a replication of the divine act of creation and our connection to it. We are naturally sexual, creative that way. We're created, creative, and we are literally creating constantly. Whether that's the saliva or the moisture and fluids in our body, urine, whether it's uh, new, new blood, uh, new uh, capillaries and new uh, skin cells and new hair, and we constantly are in motion. We're so full of life. We're so full of energy. We're such beautiful, scientific, as well as spiritual beings. You know, I say we're spiritual, we're social, we're sec sexual, and we're sensual. And we're scientific. That means knowledge. Conscience or conscience means with knowledge. Conciencia, Latin. With knowledge. We know. That's why we're here. We're all here because we know something. And uh, the sustainability of the race happens to, do, happens, happens to involve our sexuality. Later on, I'm going to talk about homosexuality or same-sex attractions, which is probably a lot more prominent than anybody ever knows. Gay, meaning only wanting one sex, uh, same sex, is a little bit more strange than being, I would say, bisexual or having some kind of recognition of both sexes and a certain appreciation. Maybe not a sexual passion or drive, but an admiration, a fondness for both sexes. Most people enjoy both. Male and females. Uh, women enjoy women, like hanging out. I call that homo sociology. It may not be homosexuality, but some women enjoy socializing primarily, some exclusively with women. They only want men for sex. Same with men. Some men want to do fishing and hunting and, and, and golfing and sports only with the dudes, with the guys. They only want sex with their wife. They don't want to even go to a movie with her hardly. I've counseled couples who have that as a major problem in their marriage. Homo sociology. <laughs> and then you have same sect, S-E-C-T. Sectarianism. Same sect relationships are sometimes and far more threatening than same sex relations. I'm not threatened by a homosexual couple or a homosexual. I am sometimes or feel threatened by a same sect institution that doesn't believe any other sect is going to heaven or is favored by God or loved by God or considered holy or righteous than their particular sect or denomination or group, whether Muslim, Hindu, Jewish, Christian, Pentecostal, Christian, Catholic, Protestant, Gen uh, 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 Gentile, Jew, all these different d d uh, diversions we have. Um, there's the sameness in all of us and certainly the sexual part of us is very similar, if not the same. So there's always going to be something sexual about God 
and our worship of the gods who we believe created us as sexual, sensual, social, and spiritual beings. So in our subconscious reality, the act of, 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 of uh, procreating or replenishing the earth um, through sexual intimacy is a replication of the divine act of creation. We do it incentively. We do it naturally, we are intrinsically. We are sexual beings. We need to stop apologizing for that. And we need to stop being intimidated by that or because of it. One of the other early Old Testament references to multiplication is recorded in Genesis 8. As long as the earth remains or endures, seed, time, and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Everything starts with a seed, either a, a, a um, sexual seed or semen or an idea or a thought or a word. Everything s starts farming our food that we eat, the world that we live in. Seeding and harvesting is part of it. One way or another, intentionally or not, most religions equate sexuality and sensuality with spirituality. And I'll tell you about the Olympics and who could, the guy who could run the fastest or jump the highest or throw the javelin the farthest was considered a son of the gods. Olympiad is where the gods lived. And they've always been known to have sex with humans, kind of like Christianity and the Holy Spirit impregnating a young 12 or 13 year old girl, a virgin named Mary. Christianity is a fertility religion. It starts with the deity impregnating. We don't like to say having sex, do we? but impregnating, inseminating, that's where we get the word seminary, inseminating a young girl, out of which is birthed Jesus, who's called the Son or a Son of God, and is res erected. <laughs> Erection, and, and it stands when it means to stand up again. That's a sensual term, as well as a spiritual term getting up from being dead. These are all powerful considerations that most of us ignore or tend to ignore, would prefer to ignore because we don't want to equate sexuality or sensuality at all with spirituality because it's scary. Diet has its place as well, but Jesus is recorded to have said the kingdom of heaven is not a matter of what you eat or drink, whether that's kosher or non-alcoholic. Righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost is what the kingdom of God is. It says it has nothing to do with diet. It has nothing to do with what you eat or what you drink. And in many ways, it has nothing to do with the other appetite, which is sex. But the kingdom of heaven is a matter of righteousness, peace. It deals with matters of, when I say righteousness, I'm not talking about Jewish legalism. I'm talking about, and so would Jesus have been talking about accurate living living your accurate, precise, exact, best self. That's the only way you're going to have peace. And that peace, which means ultimate calm resolve, would lead to joy. Not always happiness, but an inner illumination of self and soul. Joy, unspeakable, full of glory or clarity. So sexual desire uh, is also created and amplified through sexual tension which is caused by sexual desire that has yet to be consummated. So the tension in men experience it physically uh, more than, than females do. The tension or the ten intensity of our physicality uh, when, when the blood fills our muscles and we become more masculine or muscular. Uh, we feel it in, in the energy of the soul. The testosterone is kicked in and man feels more like a man and he feels real sensual or real sexual. And, and for some people, even more spiritual at that time. Um, sexual desire can be spontaneous or responsive. It can just come up on you spontaneously with, without any particular um, stimuli. It just happens. Or it can be in response to something. Sexual desire is dynamic. It can either be positive or it can be negative. Many people have bad sexual experiences, bad uh, sexual uh, encounters, painful, uh, non-climactic. Um, sometimes the, the, 
the physical aspect of particularly destroys the emotional aspect of it or the emotional aspect of it is opposed to the physical aspect of it. Sometimes you can be um, emotionally sexual but not physically sexual or physically sexual and there's no emotion in it. So it's a very awkward experience of the human uh, trait. So um, again, sexual desire is, does have a certain dynamic to it and it can be either positive or negative and can vary in intensity depending on desired object or person. What you want sexually, what you think you need sexually, what time you need. You can be in the mood and your partner isn't, or your partner is not present, or you're, you're on the road. I mean, it happens. Many of the evangelists in my tradition would go on these long Holy Ghost revivals. They're supposed to go for three days or a week and the Holy Ghost would fall, so the altars were full and he would stay another week and then another week, and everybody would say, oh my, the Holy Ghost is all over this place. Folks are driving in. You, something, sometimes they'll be using horses and carriages back in the ancient day. The, eva the evangelist or revivalist is away from his wife and children for long periods of time. And when the anointing lifts, the other things lifted. <laughs> he was still human. And we, it was hush-hush, but in my denomination, there were a lot of evangelists who had a record of having children outside of wedlock strung across this country. Now today you can get on jets and go back and forth, but in the ancient days, uh, or the, you know, I'm talking maybe, you know, 50, 60, 80, 100 years ago, uh, a lot of the, the horse, the, the itinerant preachers were on horseback and uh, going all over the world. And sometimes, the, especially in the black culture, we didn't stay in hotels, you stayed in the homes of the saints and uh, whoever had a vacant room. And sometimes it was a single mother with a little daughter and the daughter would bring, take, go back there baby and take the evangelist a piece of pie and a piece of thigh. You know, sometimes stuff happened. I'm, I'm, can we talk? Don't freak out because it happened and I know about it. My, my grandfather was, was a victim of that and victimized women that way. Some of my uncles had issues with um, extramarital, they weren't always affairs, but it was just extramarital sex. And some men, preachers included, have angry, unattractive wives and, or who are, not, who are bored or not interested in sex. Man's got to have sex. If a, a person is passionate in the pulpit, he's going to be passionate in the bedroom, generally. If he's passionate on the athletic field or court or on the stage, he's generally going to be passionate in the and because there's a high, there's a, there's a sensual, spiritual, and sexual high that can occur right while you're ministering or right while you're performing. The testosterone levels are really high in competitive sports. Men can, can become aroused playing basketball, wrestling, playing football, tennis, just racing, playing soccer, that anything that's physical, that desires, that, that demands physical adrenaline and testosterone, the drive, the passion, the competitiveness. So it's hard for those guys not to act out their, their sexuality otherwise when they get off the field. Sometimes they're still pretty high. A lot of the athletes, and preachers don't do it as much, but the athletes, well, some preachers don't go to parties, but they get together and eat and laugh and talk, and, and then loneliness sets in. I was single for 40 years traveling all over the world. I had many lonely nights. I did not have affairs. I got pretty close to some things that got me close to serious trouble because I was human. In fact, I was astounded that I could have such an anointing in the pulpit and be so human otherwise or elsewhere. It's a dichotomy. <laughs> you, 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 you're in touch with your, your um, human self and your divine self. And sometimes we don't know how to bridge them. We just try to break them. Uh, it's hard to, nobody teaches, they don't teach you this in seminary. So men go through this and politi politicians go through it. Women do too, anybody in a powerful position, but for some reason, um, men in a powerful position attract, you know, like when the Beatles came, that's the first time, and then later, I guess with Elvis Presley, you heard all these girls screaming and crying and fainting. I couldn't get it, I mean, to save my life. I did not understand, I still don't, why somebody would be that freaked out over an entertainer or anybody. But these girls, just all these girls, and it was a fantasy for a lot of men to say, well, maybe I could, maybe I could do uh, Elvis Presley. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
But then Michael Jackson, who wasn't all that masculine, very feminine, very, you know, talking soft. The girls were screaming for him too, <laughs> going nuts. And the boys were too. Uh, there's something about that entertainment, the adrenaline, the testosterone, the ego, the psyche, just like it happens in a rock uh, concert, it happens in a revival. It happens in a conference. The speaker's cool, or she is. They've got their stuff. Men tend to have more problems with dealing with sex and uh, the availability of women. And when I, when I was single, there were no street women, quote unquote, prostitutes, whores, or sluts and stuff, hustling me. The only women that propositioned me were Christian women, Holy Ghost filled, tongue talking women who were the French interpretation. <laughs> the, those are the only kind of women that, that came after me. I wasn't hustling women, didn't have to. So my experience has never been Vegas, you know, world. It's been religious and, and a, a, a lot of religious, whether you're a priest or a prophet, pastor, preacher, evangelist, we're humans and this stuff happens. And the, libi the libido and the sexual desire is there and the drive is there and uh, we don't always know how to do it. I fasted and prayed for days, three days, seven days, 14 days, 21 days, 30 days, 40 days, all my life, particularly my single life. And I still do in my married life, but I did it more in my single life, trying to, as Paul said, I beat my body and make it my slave, King James, so that I will not be uh, thrown into a junkyard, after I finish thrown into a junkyard of preachers. You're trying to subdue the flesh, <laughs> beat your body. <laughs> I believe that, that's what the scriptures say. Um, so <laughs> we got to deal with uh, this idea that there's something very, sensual or sexual about spirituality. Certainly there's something social about it and about even Paul had to write in the, in the New Testament to the church about being single. He said he was single. He was either divorced or widowed because he was a member of the Sanhedrin court, presumably, and you couldn't be a member of the Sanhedrin without being married. So either his wife left him when he converted uh, and divorced him or she, or she died. He doesn't specify, but he does say he's single. And he says it's better to be single, but he also says it's better to be married than to burn with lust. That's the whole subject of gay marriage. If you're born gay, and Oral Roberts told me himself, Oral Roberts had a gay son. His eldest son, Ronald, was gay and ultimately committed suicide, not just because he was gay, but he was strung out on drugs, trying to desensitize himself to the pain of embarrassing his father and his family and the faith. And uh, I know this. I knew I was close to the family when he, when he died, I was, a, I was there. A um, couple of grandsons who are gay. One of them I actually performed his marriage, Randy, uh, the, the younger one, and I, uh, he married a Mormon guy. All the, Mor the, the Mormon guy, Keaton, his, his family were there, but none of the Randy's family came. One of his cousins came, and I, I'm like, he calls me uncle to this day, because I've known him since they were in diapers. Um, but there was, an, there, there, was, there was this whole idea about shame, the shame of being sexual, whether gay or straight. And for Ronald to have committed suicide was very painful for all of his family, deeply, deeply wounding. And to all of us associated with the family and those of us who knew him even if only from a distance. Um, but there's something very powerful about our sociology and about our spirituality, about our sensuality and our sexuality, and we're still learning how to deal with it. Um, so seed, sowing seed, reaping harvest can be physical, can be mental, can be verbal, can be attitudinal. And it's part of who we are. It's just part of the way we are created. Again, I said di diet has its place, but Jesus said the kingdom of God has nothing to do with what you eat or drink. Sexual desire can be spontaneous. It can be, um, positive or negative. And, um, the sexual desire uh, spectrum is described by writer Stephen B. Levine as aversion, A-V-E-R-S-I-O-N, disinclination, indifference, interest, need, and passion. Aversion, sexual desire, 
disinclination, disinterested, disinterest, I should say, indifference, I don't care, I'm not turned on or off, could take it or leave it, or great interest, great need, great passion, and it can vary. In marriage, sometimes you can be so turned on, some mar- and times you can be very turned off. In any religious, there's sometimes there, you're not interested in the sexual part, you're just interested in the social part. I remember one of my sisters hung out with some gay guys and, and a lot of them, and they, they did her hair, and, she, and I said to her one time, uh, why are, you, why, why are you, you, you're so comfortable with all these gay guys? And she said, oh, she named one of them. She said, he just, he's just one of the girls. <laughs> and she really felt totally unintimidated by him because he was more like her than he was like me or like a man. And he was comfortable with that. And she was comfortable. That was, a, that was when I began to think, well, that's pretty interesting because I wasn't threatened or by her hanging with this guy all the time. My daughter has gay friends. They come around all the time. She's very comfortable with them. I'm comfortable with them because I, I'm not threatened by them. I mean, male friends, she has gay girlfriends as well that come around. She went to a school in Chicago called Shy Arts and most of the students there, I would say 80 to 75 to 80% of them were gay or had inclinations toward bisexuality or whatever. I was never intimidated by that or her. She, she made her friends and she had, she had a boyfriend and she went date, date with her boyfriends, but she also brought her gay friends home sometime. We laughed and talked, I fed them popcorn and cookies. We taught our children to be radically inclusive and to not judge anybody and we don't judge. So we feel real good about um, growing into this reality. If you would talk to your children this way, or we would talk to our children or talk to the culture very openly, very solidly, let's, let's take the taboo away from sexuality. Because the more you make it mysterious, the more they're going to be curious. Open up about it. Talk about it. And um, the church needs to pull their head out of the sand and start dealing with this very realistically and not live in denial. I'm going to stop for now, and, uh, but we'll continue with this series. There's so much more that, that we're going to get to. But think about we're talking about sex, sexuality, human sexuality, and homosexuality in the 20th century. I'm alluding to scriptures, but I'm also just giving philosophy and practicality and how we deal with the fact that we're human beings being human. We'll see you the next time.